Okay. So we touched on this just before the break, and we've seen this um, during a number of other slides throughout the week. But this version includes a couple of subtle differences. We're now starting to put some numbers behind these different states of, of lubrication. And we're going to start talking about a minimum thickness of lubrication or of lubricant that we can achieve. Ideally, we want the greatest thickness of lubrication so that these two surfaces effectively are entirely separated. And we know that that happens in this regime of lubrication. So we want the greatest film thickness possible, but that clearly has to be in some way relative to the roughness of the surface, i.e. that you can have a, a one millimeter thick layer of lubricant, but if your average surface roughness is three millimeters, then you're not going to be in this state of lubrication. That's to say that you want the film thickness to be thicker than the roughness to give you a chance of having fluid film lubrication. Because we're dealing here with the mean roughness and not the maximum roughness, because it's the mean roughness, then when you get unity between the two, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have extended into fluid film lubrication. So at any number less than one, we know that the mean roughness is going to be greater than the film thickness. So we're going to be in boundary lubrication. Our lambda ratio, if it's less than one, means that we're in boundary lubrication. If our lambda ratio is greater than one, then because we're dealing with a mean roughness and not the most severe case of roughness, then we enter this likelihood of mixed lubrication. And indeed, between one and three as a lambda ratio, you get to mixed lubrication. Greater than three, we're confident that the surfaces are totally separated, and so we enter this region of hydrodynamic lubrication. So suddenly, we've got some numbers to be driving towards. That as engineers, we want this ratio to be three or more, because then we get the superior lubrication, and so we have the best chance of minimizing wear. And so we know that we want the smoothest surfaces. That's not a surprise. And so when we talk about ceramics, we know they're hard and can be um, surface finished to a, a very smooth um, end point, end product. And indeed, when we deal with metals, we know that the surface finish of those can be highly polished too. So we can control the denominator. We can control this roughness. There's still scope to, to improve materials further still, no doubt. There must be ways of achieving greater surface finish than what we do now. But that's, again, probably going to be a marginal gain. It's hard to see how that can create the step change in implant design that we really need to jump from this kind of 15, 20 years, potentially to double that in terms of a lifespan. And so the, the thing that we've really got to concentrate on is, is trying to maximize the thickness of the film that we develop, such that we can always have, ideally always have our implants operating at the best superior lubrication system. It means that we need to have knowledge of the materials that the body can knowingly um, put up with that are biocompatible. Because when it comes to determining the fluid film layer thickness and by estimating it, the stiffness of the interacting surfaces is key. It's a very significant contributor to it. We know that cortical bone and cancellous bone are relatively elastic versus the materials that we put in. tenfold, fold 15-fold greater in some instances. 
And so maybe if we're looking at innovative solutions, this is a ratio or a comparison that we need to give more thought to. There's only one real polymer that's used throughout bearing surface and, and replacement surface design at the minute. Cross-linked ultra high molecular weight polyethylene is a bit stiffer than that, but generally we're in that kind of ballpark in terms of the materials that we're using today. Metals, again, a very narrow band of metals that we can really use. 316L is typically the stainless steel that's used. Ceramics, a handful of those are used, alumina and zirconium, they're harder. And you can get, at times, a better surface finish too. And you can get a far tighter clearance with ceramic on ceramic than you can do with any of the other material combinations. And so this is the kind of information that, that engineers have on hand. None of these are surprised. It's not revolutionary, any of that, that data. But how do we use it? Here we've got the picture from earlier. So we have a cup, and the hip femoral head fits within that cup. Not everyone can see it, but there's a, a red circle that is the radius of the acetabulum cup. The black circle mimics the radius of the femoral head. In essence, we're calling the acetabulum cup, the hip, uh, sphere two, the femoral head, sphere one. And here we have an equation that defines the film thickness in elastohydrodynamic lubrication. And this has been around since the 70s. Hamrick and Dowson proposed this specifically to try and resolve the conundrum that is synovial joint replacement. Dowson has spent decades of his career looking to try and find solutions to this, this problem. And so our film thickness which remember we divide by mean roughness to create our lambda ratio, is defined by the synovial fluid viscosity times the speed within the joint, divided by a combination of the two material stiffnesses, Young's moduli, and the radius to the power of 0.65, times by the load going through the joint over this Young's modulus value and the reduced radii again, to the power of minus or negative 20, uh, 0.21. And so that's the equation that Hamrick and Dowson have proposed to, to use. The reduced radii we can calculate by multiplying the radii of these two together. So we can presume that we have a polyethylene cup and a cobalt chrome femoral head. And we can start putting numbers into these equations to predict the type of lubrication regime that we'll get between these two typical interfacing materials. Here we're going to assume that we've got a radial head, uh, ephemeral head radii of, of 14, so a 28 mil diameter uh, head. Clearance, common clearance 0.2, elastic modulus of the cup, 1,000 megapascals, Poisson's ratio of the cup 0.4. 210 gigapascals for the elastic modulus of the cobalt chrome head with a Poisson's ratio of 0.3. Load going through the joint, 2.5 kilonewtons. Angular velocity of the joint, 
two radians per second, synovial fluid viscosity 0 0.005. The polyethylene cup has a surface roughness of one micron, the cobalt chrome head a nominal roughness of 0 0.02 microns. So that's our data, effectively mirrored onto the right side of the, the board. And we need to follow through the process to, to determine this. And so we start by calculating our reduced radius. And so that is R1, R2 divided by the difference between R2 and R1. And so we know that we have a 0 0.014 femoral head in terms of meters. And we can determine, by adding on the radial clearance, we can determine the radius of, of R2. And fortunately, I've done it already. We get 0.994 meters as our reduced radius. We can determine what we call the entraining velocity. So we can see that this component features in the first part of the equation to calculate h min. The cup doesn't move, so we can call that zero as a velocity. The velocity of the head is the angular rotation multiplied by the radius. And so we can get, in essence, a, an average velocity of 0 0.014 meters per second. We then need our equivalent Young's modulus, which is calculated by involving the Poisson's ratio and the Young's modulus of each material. And we get that to be 2.3 gigapascals. So we know our viscosity. We now know our velocity. We've got our equivalent Young's modulus. We know the radius. We know the load. And so we can start looking at H min. And so H min, put our numbers into there, gives us 8 times 10 to the 8 meters. And so that's our layer thickness. We've got a very, very thin layer of lubricant that generates between a cobalt chrome, uh, chrome cup and a polyethylene head. The only way we're going to determine whether we're in boundary mixed or fluid film lubrication is to appreciate whether this thickness or the relative thickness of this versus the surface roughness of the two materials. So we get our composite roughness by the square root of RA1, so it's a roughness, a measure of roughness of surface one and surface two. So the average of the two of them, one by 10 to the six meters. And so dividing one by the other, we get a lambda ratio for this interaction of 0 0.08. So we come straight back to our Strybeck curve, and we see that cobalt chrome versus polyethylene gives us a boundary lubrication system only. And so this equation is quite powerful in terms of evaluating the potential of new materials. Clearly, once you've done it once, there's only so many parameters that, as an engineer, you can actually change. So you can look at different femoral head sizes. The load, um, how do you reduce the load going through it? That's down to um, clinicians' discussion with the patient. The RA, there will be some opportunity to reduce the RA as new uh, finishing techniques come on the market. But again, you find it hard to see how even a dramatic change in RA is going to overly influence the type of lubrication that you can generate. Viscosity, that's fixed. That's the synovial fluid viscosity. 
You can influence the velocity by having different radial sizes. But in terms of the step change that we can introduce from engineering, these are our parameters, but there aren't all that many that we can influence substantially these days. There, there are only marginal gains, one imagines, that can be made against each of those that are in some way within the grasp of an engineer. And so where is our step change going to come from? Where are we going to go, given that it seems that the technology is maximizing the benefits that can be achieved by these materials? Maybe it's this. Maybe it's the ability to design implants that are specific to a person. Whilst our engineering theory enables us to design the perfect engineering solution, maybe when we give it to our end user, which is the surgeon, it's just impractical or impossible to achieve those perfect conditions. We're talking about such fine tolerances, such fine clearances. Less than a mil in terms of radial clearance. That relies on presumably incredibly accurate and repeatable clinical techniques. In reality, is that achievable? Do we know enough as engineers about what the surgeons do go through? Merely observing an operation and the fact that hammers and mallets are involved would indicate that that's not necessarily an industry that's going to be able to achieve the tolerances that we're after. You wouldn't ask a carpenter to make a cut such that your door was swinging with a clearance of 0.2 millimeters from the floor. That's just totally improbable. And so why do we expect surgeons to be able to quite literally operate within those constraints. Maybe we need to ditch all that and start by designing implants that are specific to the shape of our body. And then apply that theory afterwards, secondarily, and thus create more opportunities for success. Additive manufacturing now means that this kind of solution is realizable. It's not ridiculously expensive as to be outside of the realms of, of some budgets. It's still vastly more expensive than a typical casting process to get our current orthopedic implants. But like every technology, it's quite conceivable that that price will reduce um, considerably over time. And so patient-specific implants currently are predominantly used where anatomy is, is far more complex than average. So here we would see an example of a pelvis. And normally, our cup is screwed into bone that sits immediately behind it. Here, for one reason or another, there is no bone. That's a void of bone within the pelvis. And so turning up with your standard cup and a couple of screws is going to be totally worthless because there's nothing to screw into. And so we can take CT data and effectively design a space filler with a cup embedded in it. And so that's where current patient-specific implantation is being exploited at the minute. So a surgeon will gather the CT, the MRI images. And in this example, which is taken from the Baltic Implants website. Here, our surgeon would, of course, email that to, to Ortho Baltic. They would use software to generate a CAD reconstruction, 3D CAD reconstruction of, in this instance, a pelvis. And then the part that engineers are most familiar with, they would effectively design a new component that fits within the void of that patient's hip. They would then go through FEA. They would look for the usual peak stress and strain fields. 
And when they got to a stage where they were happy with the design, that would go back to the surgeon for approval. The surgeon would say, yep, that is going to function. Or that design is a design that, that I can reasonably implant. So when the, the concept is approved, it then becomes reality. It's 3D printed. So that concept is 3D printed. Goes through quality control, sterilization, and then sent off to be implanted in theater. And this is a process that's happening now. Happens all the time in a small number of cases. Happens for orthopedics, it happens in maxillofacial facial surgery in the, the face as well. And it provides opportunity to fix these more complex cases. Here we have a knee. And we can see how the segmentation process works. And so we have clinical images of a femur, software defines in 2D the outline of that femur, and then sequentially does that to, to the other images, and then stacks those images with a prescribed slide thickness together. And it effectively interpolates between the data on one slide and the neighboring slide and so on, renders an image that is quite believable. Here we see the patella as well, the kneecap, um, the fibula, uh, and the tibia as well. And so we can visually get a good appreciation as to exactly what happens. And so here you would have a traditional knee. And we need to be sensitive. These are commercial pictures. And so it would be reasonable to presume that these are relatively extreme cases. But it gives you an appreciation of the cuts that a surgeon has to make. Has to cut the anterior surface um, of the, articula the, uh, the anterior articulating cartilage surface away and cut underneath and behind to enable a conventional total knee replacement to be fitted in place. Sits on top of the metallic tray and our perspex, uh, our polyethylene liner. And there are issues. It's too big at the back. There's bone that's exposed on the side. And the size of this knee, because it is like a shoe, there are sizes of knees as there are sizes of shoes. We recognize when a shoe is a better fit and a worse fit, and we stand in the shoe shop and, until we're happy. And surgeons don't have quite the luxury of, of time and opportunity to go through a series of different designs and sizes of shoes. But preoperatively, they will size up an implant based on the uh, the pre-op images. And so, yes, you'll get some overhang, but it won't be dramatic. Yes, you'll have some exposed bone. It's not ideal. But in reality, are either of those resolving those problems going to change the longevity of an implant dramatically? Probably not. But you can design a knee that fits perfectly. What surgeons are telling us is more valuable is to have a patient-specific cutting guide. That's currently where the market of designing for a specific patient is growing fastest. And that's to say that it doesn't take a lot of imagination to appreciate that making these cuts is difficult. You wouldn't do it freehand. You have to have some kind of template in place that you cut against. And there is currently recognized to be value that if you had a jig to cut against that was specific to the anatomy, then you're going to get a better fit between your conventional implant and your bespoke geometry of, of bone. And so a good way of achieving a better fit, and if you get a better fit, you get better biomechanics, is by having a patient-specific cutting guide made for you. 
And so that's the current area of interest. But it's hard not to imagine that somewhere within this technology lies opportunities to twin with this theory to make some kind of improvement from the 15 to 20 years that we're currently getting to an increase of time which we recognize is urgently required. And so that touches on the work of, of implants. And we're going to spend the last 20 minutes or so looking at fracture prevention. And again, some of the emerging technologies that are used for it. A very brief recap. We know that the trend of fracture is that one significant load can cause fracture, can, buy, uh, can pass and exceed the theory of the threshold of fracture. And equally, several lower load exposures can cause fracture too. And that there's a series of stages of remodeling that the bone goes through. None of that is, is hugely surprising. I'm going to focus a little bit more on bone remodeling. We've appreciated that when there's a bone plate, as in the ulna here, remove the bone plate and the bone has resorbed. And so the patient is at greater risk of fracture when an open reduction and internal fixation has taken place. That is, that the wound has been opened up, that the bones have been repositioned, reduced, and they've been internally fixated. They've been plated into place. So bone remodeling actually follows this kind of trend. This is the, the trend that we're most interested in. And that's to say that if you have no movement, so this x-axis here is strain. If you have no movement at all, there's no strain, then you don't encourage bone formation. You're not on the other side of the x-axis. So it's recognized that bones need some strain to repair. And there comes a point where you get to an optimal amount of strain that achieves maximal bone formation, have too much, it starts to fall away and it starts to resorb again. So bone remodeling is known to have an optimal amount of strain to achieve maximal bone formation. Focusing in on this region here gives us a plot that looks something like this. And so Wolf's law is that as we increase the strain, we get to a stage where we're within a region of strain that achieves healing. We need to be careful that we don't have, that whilst we want to encourage strain, we don't necessarily want to encourage the fragments of a fracture to move relative to one another. And so the two are, to a certain extent, competing. There's no point in having strain, yet one part is moving relative to another. And as you're probably aware, given the work that you've done here, there are various FE models that exist that enable us to predict bone remodeling based on the strains experienced within the bone uh, when implanted with a femoral stem. But this all hinges on periprosthetic fracture. So we've spoken about periprosthetic fracture previously. And so we're considering the risk of fracture at the base of or along the length of an implant. And so we've talked about the stress shielding in the ulnar plate and the risk of stress shielding happening at either end of the plate because you have this transition from a stiff plate to a relatively flexible bone. If we consider again our hip, or half a hip, 
So we consider our hip. Periprosthetic fractures are so prevalent that a classification system of them exists. And so you don't just get a periprosthetic fracture, you have a classification of periprosthetic fractures that exist. And so here's our healthy hip. We're talking about removing the healthy hip. And with, with an invisible pen. There we are. It's all right, the board's wet. There is a hip on there somewhere. But it's a stem that's important by good fortune. So we're dealing with a femoral stem. And because this problem of periprosthetic fractures is so prevalent, then a classification system exists to name them so that surgeons know exactly what they're dealing with. This is called the Vancouver system classification of periprosthetic fractures. And this particular table describes the femoral um, replacement. And various papers throughout the years have agreed that type B fractures are the most common when dealing with the femur. So we're talking about fractures that are either around the stem or extending just below it, whilst the femoral component is solidly fixed. Fractures around the stem or extending just below it in which the femoral component is loose. Fractures around the stem or extending just below it in which the femoral component is loose and there is severe bone loss as well. So we've talked about all of these conditions over the past few days. Bone loss is probable when you have cell necrosis, cell death, as a consequence of too much strain, too much movement of the implant, typically around the base, and so you'd perhaps have a periprosthetic fracture at the base. How do you fix it? So you have your implant in place, and we're gonna say that we have a periprosthetic fracture here. So this has been done, that's been implanted, and then a fall has caused a fracture of the femur. What do you do? One of the key things of fixation is to get plates in and to get good bone grip with the screws by screwing into the cortical bone. Ideally, you go through the cortical bone, a bicortical screw that sticks out the other side to get even greater purchase on your plate. So open reduction, so opening up the wound, internal fixation, so you fix a plate over the fracture, remains the treatment method of choice for B1 fractures. So your your implant is solidly in position, so you don't want to fiddle around with the, the hip, but you've got something to do to manage the fracture. Multiple approaches have been reported in the literature. However, not one has been identified as being superior to the other. But this is known to be a very difficult fracture to fix because you have <coughs> the hip prosthesis in place, in the way. And in addition, you've also got the cement mantle, the body of cement that surrounds that stem. And that means there's limited space for placement of screws in this part of the femur, which risks stabilizing the fracture. And this was a project that a surgeon did with us, and he added to the literature, or will add to the literature when he writes it up, that describes his approach. And this is quite a nice study because it starts to bring together some of the concepts that we've described previously. This is a bone, a plastic bone. This one was purchased from the company called Sawbones. And here is a femoral head, and the, the stem extends into the sawbone. We can just about see a fracture. So this is a B1 Vancouver fracture. The, 
implant is solidly in position, but we've had a fracture that is at the tip of the femoral stem. Here is a plate. This is called a locking plate um, because the holes have a thread which interfaces with the thread at the very top of the screw head. And so the screw actually locks into the plate in addition to gripping into the bone. But you can see the problem. Here we can have three screws that protrude bicortically. They go through both the near and the far surface of the bone. At the top, it's far harder to achieve because you can't get through the bone because the femur's in, in the way. And now what this surgeon decided to do was test whether a lag screw, so there's a screw head sticking out there, and it goes diagonally across the fracture site. He's seeing whether by adding a lag screw into that construct can increase the stability of the fracture or not. And it is a nice snapshot into how orthopedic surgery interfaces with biomechanics. Because we know these fractures are common. It said it in the earlier slide. Biomechanically, we can appreciate why they happen because there is bone remodeling that will take place and so there's a higher risk of periprosthetic fracture. So the theory holds true. And yet, we're in a position whereby there isn't a gold standard approach to fixing it. The question here was, does a lag screw increase the stiffness of the construct? Then the question thereafter would be, is that replicated in the human body? And if so, does the strain that it's constraining place it within that optimal range of bone growth? So this is clearly a lab-based study. That's had limitations that we've touched on earlier. But this is one way of deriving fundamental data that can drive forward the subject. But unlike mechanical engineering studies, we can't presume that if this happens in the lab, then it's 99% certain to happen in our applied environment. Our applied environment is clearly a lot different to what we're doing here. And, and here you see our bone. We've inverted it. So the femoral head is now down here. And the condyles are wedged in this machine. You can see that this is a white spray with black dots. And so this is the DIC that we were talking about, where we have lots of dots on the bone. And we have a camera. So on the outside of the bone, we have this random speckle pattern. We have two cameras. One's measuring what's happening over here. One's measuring what's happening here. And we can see visually the relative change in displacement of those dots. Those dots on the surface will clearly move as the, as the material strains. And then you plug it into software that picks up that data. Here with a, a bit of reassurance, hopefully you'll believe me that we have our bone construction here, still upside down. There's the white paint. And then we have a camera. So this rod effectively is a, a tripod for two cameras, one of which is mounted here, one of which is mounted here. And there are two lamps just out of sight that are giving off um, light to illuminate that. And so we're hoping to measure the difference in the displacement of effectively these black dust particles to give us a measure of strain at that interface. This is what we saw. So as a control, we did a saw bone or a, any kind of bone, an artificial bone, without a prosthesis and without a lag screw. So we still had our plate. But we had the, the conventional femoral head and measured the strain on that. And we use this kind of chart here 
as a visual tool to try and identify the peak strains, but the software does it more accurately for us. We put a lag screw across, but still no femoral head to see what happened then, giving us interesting data in terms of um, standard fracture repair. So not periprosthetic fracture, but standard fracture repair. We then put in a hip prosthesis. There is still a plate on there, but there's no lag screw. And then finally, we had our lag screw across the fracture and the prosthesis in place as well. And we saw, perhaps unsurprisingly, that you do get an increase in stiffness and a decrease in strain. One of the limitations that we have, however, at the minute, is that that's kind of the end of this study. There is no, no I wouldn't say easy route, but no efficient route of trying to explore the consequence or the application of this work in a more realistic environment. In reality, if that was a human bone, would it add huge value to our study? Not really. By the time you've got it in a lab, it's still going to dry out, and it's still going to be in some way removed from reality. And yet there is potential that results such as these, and not just these, can be transformative in terms of how patients are, are treated. But the challenge is how do you get from lab-based studies for this and for our femoral replacements to translate that data into clinical practice? A couple of final slides. This is another one looking at stress shielding. We know the problem of stress shielding, that the ends of the, of the, the plates are too stiff. There's not a gradual reduction in stiffness and so at the end of this plate, you have a cliff edge of stiffness going from a very stiff metallic structure back to the relatively soft and flexible bone. In this study, we decided to explore whether additive manufacturing would give us the opportunity to create the geometries, but to have increasing porosity within those components. So you would have the correct stiffness centrally, but a decreasing density or increasing porosity of metal as you move towards the lateral edges, such that the interface between the bone and the plate isn't as stark. And so if we consider number five to be fully dense, number one to be less dense, or minimal density, then these four, four plates were additively manufactured out of metal. That's our clinically used um, plate currently, but each of these have stiffnesses that are crudely or that are broadly representative here. So this one at the bottom is pretty much entirely dense apart from a reduction in stiffness at the end. There's a greater reduction in stiffness at the end of the one second up. Here the grading is greater still and the top version of our plate is the one with the the most substantial change in stiffness. And we plot them, having done a similar mechanical experiment to the one that we described previously, and we can see that there is a change in behavior. So that method has promised too. The challenge is though, again, how do we get from this data, and we can repeat this data to make it cleaner, but we're still fundamentally limited by jumping from a laboratory environment to a clinical environment. At that point, that session draws to a close. Any questions? Hello. Yes. Are they? Yes, they are. Um, yes, we were trying to explore an idea using magnesium. So magnesium is probably the only metal that can be 
um, on mass absorbed by the body. Um, and you're right to say that, that whilst we can play around with graded structures, fundamentally these things cause problems. That they cause problems because they will weaken the bone. The, the challenge clinically is, is the risk of another surgery to take that plate out when the bone is healed worth the risk versus the potential of the plate remaining in place and causing injury? In children, the plate's got to come out because it will stunt bone growth. In adults, it can probably stay in. In elite sports, it probably has to come out. Um, and so that's the problem at the minute. Ideally, it should come out from, for everybody. But it's generally considered that the cost and the risk of taking them out isn't worth it versus the risk of it staying in. But that means that there is scope for um, plates that effectively resorb and so become weaker over time to the point where there's nothing left of them, and so there is no risk. Um, and there are some bone plates that, that do exist, but they're not widely used. Um, and so we were, and continue to explore the, the concept of using magnesium because it uh, effectively degrades and, be, uh, and is resorbed by the body without problem. Um, the issue that we have is that additively manufacturing a magnesium plate is very difficult because it's uh, a very um, volatile material to work with. Um, but again, that, that's a research opportunity that currently seems um, to exist. Um, one of the challenges here is that manufacturing these plates is relatively cheap. And so economically, you're going to have to come up with a solution that fits within in essence, the business model that exists clinically at the minute. The reason that they don't take them out is not only the risk of the patient, but also there's a significant cost involved in, in doing that operation. Um, in the UK, the system is slightly different, whereby the government pays for all surgery. Clearly here, the system is, uh, is a different system, but the UK government don't prioritize removal of those plates. There are more important things to spend that budget on in, in their eyes, um, unless you are someone who would be at higher risk of injury if it were to stay in. So it's certainly an area that remains to be explored uh, in detail, resorbable plates. Um, so, so you were talking about when, so if this fracture was far more severe, so if effectively we've lost this section of bone, is that what you're saying? That the best solution, so if, if this wedge of bone for some reason had been destroyed, maybe in a, a, an accident, a high energy collision of some sort, then there are limited options available. Uh, it's not as if you can replace that with a perspex wedge, for example. So typical engineering, engineering materials are out of the question. Um, you, you can't buy bone um, because the compatibility of someone else's bone or an animal's bone is very difficult. So you're effectively left with two choices. You can try and take a bone graft from somewhere else and put it in, and that might be an operation that takes a number of, of years. If not, in cases of significant trauma where there's cell death at the, the bone edges are well, then it may well be that the only solution there is to amputate. An example that you perhaps see, don't see that often perhaps, but if we were to draw our femoral head, and whereas our conventional femur would be relatively straight, you do see occasions where the femur is, is curved. And so here what will happen is that the bone will be cut intentionally, wires will be fed through the bone, they'll be fixed onto a circular frame externally connected with rods. So effectively you end up with a mechanical construction outside of the leg that is forcing the bone into a new shape. But as a consequence of that, you have gaps in, in your bone, as you would expect. 
as you straighten that bone out, you're going to have gaps as you're trying to straighten it. And so what is common is these rings are linked on a threaded rod. And the patient would be sent away with a spanner, and they would have to twist the nut that's supporting the relative position of each of these rods by about a quarter of a turn per day. And so you're gradually extending the gap between the bone. But what's happening at the same time is that the bone is slowly starting to regrow. And so these gaps are being filled naturally by the body. But the aim of this is to get this leg back to the length of the original leg. And so you want to keep making a quarter turn per day of these nuts until the, the spaces are at a point where you have a length of leg on, on the injured leg that's the same as the other leg. And so where you have time and have the ability to plan, then you can encourage bone to regrow and can control that regrow. If you're dealing with a traumatic accident where there's been substantial bone loss, then you haven't got that ability to be as controlled and as planned. And this can only work where the gap between the bone is relatively small. If you lose a substantial amount of bone, then there is no mechanism for the bone edges to communicate with each other. They're too far apart, and so you won't get that bone regrowth. And so there's no off-the-shelf commercial solution you can use to fill that space. And ultimately, putting it crudely, the only real solution is to, to resect um, or amputate the bone itself. Bone scaffolding? Um, not really. Um, it's all about can you, currently it's all about can you find a way of encouraging bone growth. And so you could have um, metallic scaffolds that are used to encourage bone growth. But again, that would be something that would be a planned intervention as opposed to uh, something through trauma. So if you're dealing with an accident, a car accident, where there's been a substantial bone loss, then currently there's no clever way as such of solving that problem. If you can't find some uh, bone from somewhere else in the body that you can perhaps use a bone graft, um, and that is, it is not in any means likely to be 100% um, successful, then you've got very few other options that are available. Here, where it's more of a planned surgery, an elective surgery, then um, using uh, kind of metal structures to encourage bone growth has been tried as well. Uh, and that's probably where the interface between tissue engineers who work in the kind of sciences field and engineers such as us that work on the, the boundary of medicine and engineering, um, that's probably where more fruitful gains will happen as we work more and more closely together. on the remodeling. Yep. Yes, yep. I would imagine dynamic. I would I'm not sure, actually. Might be lying. Mm. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that is, from, from my understanding, a bit of a gray area, but clearly not as gray as it, as it may seem from the outside, is, is FDA approval or, or the equivalent. You consider the extensive review that a, an off-the-shelf implant would have to go through to prove that it is um, a, uh, a design that is probably going to be successful. And then you look at these one-off components that are effectively being made um, by relatively small design teams, and the whole aim is to get them back to the clinician quickly. 
then you haven't got the scope to go through FDA approval and, and one would imagine as comprehensive analysis as, um, as a standard conventional design. Uh, I think my, my understanding is that in essence, they, they use an off-the-shelf design as the baseline and they marginally modify that. And so one would imagine that um, a full and comprehensive FE analysis has taken place on the, the kind of the, the parent component and that we're effectively looking at a child component, so an offshoot of the parent when it comes to uh, the patient-specific version. So probably full FEA has been done on the parent version, maybe a more simplistic FE has been done on the, uh, on the smaller or the kind of one-off uh, components. Because if not, you can imagine that the cost and the time of doing a full analysis is going to be such that it just doesn't become economically um, sensible for anyone to be involved in it. Um, but again, there, there seems to be Five years ago, this was, was happening incredibly rarely. Uh, I mean, even now, it's pretty unusual to see one, and, and certainly um, it's not unheard of for some of this still to get news coverage in the UK when it happens, because it's, it's that rare. Um, so you look at the 100,000 joint replacements that are done every year, and you would be surprised if more than 100 were patient-specific implants. Um, and so there is a huge opportunity, one imagines, for it to produce some kind of step change in, in longevity of implants themselves. Um, but at the minute, there is not a huge amount of research happening publicly um, that is pushing this technology on. Um, and so if you were looking at research areas to become involved in now, then that would seem to be, or the whole premise of patient-specific instrumentation and implants would seem to be an obvious um, line of consideration at this stage. So, so there are companies, um, it effectively comes down to the accuracy of um, or the similarity of your design versus the original design. Um, and so what you're finding is that companies are trying to take control of as much of the process as possible. Um, so for example, there are companies in Europe that take images from the patient, they own the software that, that then um, segments the image and, and builds the 3D and renders the 3D model. They then own the process that manufactures the implant, and they own the process that interfaces with the surgeon. So they're a complete workflow. And that enables them then to, to submit that workflow to the FDA to say, you know, if we follow these rules all the time, is that a workflow that will achieve approval? Um, and so that's how people are achieving what they want to at the minute. Um, and presumably within that approval process or that workflow, there are constraints uh, outside which they're not allowed to extend in terms of maybe dimensional change or material change or, or some other fundamental uh, underpinning engineering concept. Um, but it's, it's becoming the trend that the workflow is approved. Um, and then so long as you follow that workflow, the thing that comes out of the end inherently has FDA approval as well. I think both are important. Uh, you know, from a, an industrial perspective, these companies want this technology to work. And so the two parameters that are most important to them is cost and money. It's got to be as cheap and as quick as possible. And so not wanting to circumvent FDA because they can't, but wanting to make the process of gaining FDA approval as streamlined as possible it is clearly in their interest. And so um, it seems that they have the workflow that's approved such that you can then um, relatively quickly take data from a surgeon, get their approval, manufacture it, and get it back to them within a time frame that's acceptable to all. Uh, um, I shall avoid naming names, um, but companies, um, it's commercial interest to, if you own the workflow, you can then license that workflow to orthopedic companies. Um, and so if I was in a position of a company that owned an FDA approved workflow, then you would be a relatively, one would imagine you'd be a relatively attractive commodity to try and license that workflow to, to the, the orthopedic companies that we're all familiar with. Um, and so I think that is probably how the technology will evolve. 
Um, the reality is that the, the cost at the minute is significantly greater than a standard off-the-shelf implant. Um, and so when certainly in the UK and the Western world, health budgets are, are limited, and, and indeed I'm sure they are here as well. And so the, the added cost has to give obvious clinical value. Um, and that's where I think the biomechanists and the, the bioengineers can, can get involved more, um, uh, more actively because the, the workflow is now there. It can be done. The technology enables the surface finish to be equivalent to a, an off-the-shelf implant. And so they, they have a process in place that appears to add, or one would imagine should add significant value to, to an implant. The trouble is no one's really quantified that value um, and so hasn't given the uh, health funding bodies the, uh, the need or the justification to spend two, three, four times the amount on a, a patient-specific version when you could get an off-the-shelf version for a lot cheaper. Um, and so that there seems a lot of opportunity re for research in there. Uh, at the minute, it seems that even the jigs, the patient-specific jigs, um, remain um, uh, the scientific benefits of those remain unclear. Uh, and so if you think we're talking about a little cutting jig that you use once and throw away, and so they're relatively cheap, it's unclear whether the cost of that is worthwhile at the minute. And so if we can't make an argument that that has clinical value, then it's perhaps not hard to see how investing an entire knee joint or a hip joint um, to try and convince someone that that has value uh, is even harder still. And so there seems to be a lot of interest and a lot of opportunity um, in that area that, that, that is yet to be explored. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so, could you also give me uh, some idea about the price of uh, the uh, Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I don't know the price. Um, and I guess only the companies and the, the health boards that sign off the, the bill um, would know it. But if you're looking at manufacturing the volume of a hip implant in um, in metal, in a commercially viable additive manufacturing machine, then that in itself is probably going to be thousands, um, just by the volume and, uh, of material that you're using. Um, given that an entire operation for a hip or a knee in the UK costs about £10,000, that includes surgeon time, theatre time, everything, um, then you wouldn't imagine that your conventional component is going to be 25 30% of that cost. I think that's the reality here is that you could be paying two and a half thousand pounds and my conversion to rupees isn't good enough yet, but two and a half thousand pounds um, for the components alone. And then you've got all the labor time to take the clinical image through the software, to do the design, to do the FEA, to do the manufacture. You could easily imagine that that's gonna be 5,000. And then the commercial margin on top of that for profit, 10,000 at a guess. Um, so you're at an equivalent price of the entire operation for an off-the-shelf unit versus merely getting your hands on the patient-specific component. Now, I should absolutely caveat that by saying that they're all reasonable guesses, and so um, there could be companies that offer that service for a fraction of that guess. Um, but I don't think that's unreasonable given the costs that I'm aware of um, and the kind of margins that people would want to be operating within. So it could, in essence, be equal to or possibly even more than the entire operation to use one of those implants. And so clearly you need to be getting significant clinical value um, to spend two, three times the cost on, on one type of theater as you would um, on an off-the-shelf product. Uh, so the question is about uh, uh, implant Yes, yeah, so it can be done. Um, it's more established in facial reconstruction because the loads are a lot, loader, uh, a lot lower. Um, and so there is obvious value because you end up, if you have a significant facial deformation on one side of your face, the healthy side of your face or the normal side of your face is scanned, um, gone through the same process of designing an equivalence. The FEA becomes almost trivial because the loads are, are insignificant or, or not huge. Um, and then the implantation adds immediate value because you have a face that looks symmetrical. And so you can see why the arguments there are quite relatively easy to make. You know, that the face ends up being symmetrical and that's a lot better than the existing solutions. 
and the technology is such that you don't need um, to, to expose it to huge strains and stresses. So it's relatively well established in the, the MaxVac sector, uh, sector, but it's less established in orthopedics. But there are still sufficient examples around. And OK, they haven't had 15, 20 years of life yet, but the, the five years of life that those examples have had, where you have acetabulum cups that are formed unique to very significant deformations and distortions of the pelvis, there doesn't seem to be any mechanical inferiority that's causing these to fail prematurely. And so it seems that the technology is OK. Surface roughness is an issue, but they go through post-processing um, uh, to, to, to increase the, the surface finish. Um, but that happens to cast materials anyway. So that, that additional step's not hugely cost, um, costly versus conventional manufacturing routes. But it would seem that the technology is good enough. It's just that the biomechanical understanding of the advantages is probably lagging behind. Um, and people have pushed this on. They've developed the technology without perhaps the, the fundamental research uh, having happened first of all. They've spotted the commercial opportunity, developed it. Um, FDA approved this workflow. Um, but from what the literature is showing, there's not a huge um, track record of, of underpinning biomechanical research demonstrating the advantages of the, of the techniques. But that's opportunity as opposed to a negative. Oh, yes. 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 Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the question that most surgeons would then ask is how else do we do it? Um, they have an immediate problem there. So that, that picture on the left, oh, was he trips over an extension lead. So that picture on the left is a common example of what happens. You know, these Vancouver B, uh, B1 fractures um, are commonplace. Uh, and so that's the problem they're solved with, uh, that they're faced with. And undoubtedly adding more screws into even that bone there, which is a healthy bone. But if you imagine in a relatively elderly lady, this bone is weak because it's osteoporotic. It's weak because you've got a femoral stem in it. It's undoubtedly an unfavorable position to be in. But if you weren't to put screws through here and up here, and you can see there's actually a wire wrapped around the top, as, or you might not be able to see, there's a wire wrapped around the top as well to increase stability yet avoiding drilling into the um, uh, into the, the bone again. If you don't use screws, then how else do you do it? How else do you get the amount of stability that you need to encourage bone growth, um, but avoid using screws? And I think that's, that's another issue is, uh, are there any other methods of, of solving these problems? You know, the, the clinicians are quite happy to tell us the problems. If we have the right conversations, we, we as engineers understand the problems. Um, it's a matter of then how do you find the solution? Um, and it's typically down to research money as well, or, or not getting enough research money. Um, and it's because of demand. Uh, you know, there are, there are fixed budgets everywhere in the world, no doubt. Um, and the number of patients that have a periprosthetic fracture is probably doesn't create sufficient demand to prioritize this research over a different problem that has a greater number of people that are more severely affected, perhaps. Um, and so it comes down perhaps bizarrely, to um, small student-led projects that are trying gradually to generate more data to allow people to make a more informed decision. Um, and so you would imagine that these sort of problems could be solved very quickly if enough time and effort and money was thrown at it. But we're operating in a world where that, those budgets aren't infinitely large. Uh, and so there's only incremental progress that we can make. And that, that doesn't matter whether you're here, whether you're in the UK, or whether you're, you're um, further afield still. Okay, thank you.